Um, I just want to offer a very warm welcome to Jane Linfoot um, and thank her for those. <laughs> I'd really like to start actually from the beginning and sort of ask you a little bit about how you actually came into the heady world of filmmaking. <laughs> Um, yes, I didn't really have a um, conventional route into filmmaking. Um, I didn't have an aspiration to become a filmmaker, oddly enough, um, mainly because it's just something that I didn't think I'd be able to do, um, so the thought didn't enter my head. Um, I had a love for film, music, art, photography, but I didn't train in any of those disciplines. I didn't go to film school, I didn't go to art school. Why am I here? Um, <laughs> I actually started work as a runner in production and I worked my way up to become a um, line producer working mainly on high-end commercials. Um, and it was midway through my um, production career that I decided to take some time out and explore some other avenues. Um, I worked for a year as a director's assistant for a Russian filmmaker, Sergei Bodrov, um, and that was in London, not in Russia. Um, shortly after that, I travelled to Thailand to volunteer for a um, charity that supported the plight of the Karen Hill tribes. Um, and that's when I first picked up a video camera um, and shot my first observational film for the Karen um, Hill Tribes um, on the Thai-Burmese border. And when I came back from that trip, I thought maybe my next challenge could be to make a fictional film. So that's what I set out to do. Um, and I um, went back to work in production on a freelance basis. Um, and I um, basically used all of my savings, my subsequent earnings, um, production contacts, really kind colleagues, and um, production experience to set about making what became um, three short films that I wrote, directed, produced, self-financed. <laughs> and then the fourth one, Sea View, was um, obviously through the BFI. So that was my route. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously having all that vast experience as a producer and then um, obviously now kind of working with a producer on Sea View, um, how, how difficult is it to kind of make that transition between your sort of logistical producerial side and, um, and kind of inviting in the kind of creative process of uh, writing and directing? Um, do, you, do you sort of switch between the two or um, kind of how was it, was it useful to work with a producer on Oh on my CV? God, yes. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it sounds like I'm a complete control freak to do all of those jobs, <laughs> but basically it's because I... Um, I just didn't have any joy getting funding. And um, because I'd worked in production, obviously, I had all the contacts and it was my savings that I was, you know, spending. Um, and it just felt rude to kind of ask somebody to ask favours on my behalf. Um, so effectively, I just thought, well, if, you know, I'm asking for these huge favours from people, I need to be doing that, really. So you didn't get, um, out of, didn't get a producer out of politeness? <laughs> well, no, it was that thing of if I'd had the support, if I'd had the money, hmm. um, then I would have gladly, you know, handed over. But also it is that thing of, you know, that was what I knew the most about. So um, when you're working at this level, um, you know, no disrespect, but some of the producers kind of starting out in short films wouldn't have had that level of production experience. Um, so, you know, I knew I had that. Um, but, yeah, it was mainly because I knew I was asking such big favours um, from people that I just felt that had to come from me, and that's part of the job. But, you know, to answer your question about making that transition, um, you know, I was really lucky with View that I found a wonderful producer, Anna Doffield, who's here tonight. Um, and, you know, it's great, one, to have that sort of female solidarity on set, um, but also having a producer who is... Um, Anna's a very creative producer, and she's, um, you know, she's got great taste. Um, so it's just nice to share something for once and not carry all the load. And um, with my feature work, I'm also working with um, two female producers, um, Caroline Cooper-Charles and Sarada McDermott. Um, so, yeah, it's brilliant for me to finally, you know, feel like I've got a team. Um, so, yes, I've, I kind of gladly hand over the, <laughs> the production hat, finally. <laughs> and what's kind of... Um, what sort of draws you? What's your fascination with this... Um area of kind of growing up and teenhoods and and the troubles faced by young people in these situations um because they're I mean they're striking observations and I just um obviously it's something you have a sort of preoccupation with I was wondering kind of where that's sort of stems from 
I think um, the experience of being a teenager sort of involves um, wrestling like with a barrage of conflicting emotions um, and not necessarily having the life experience to deal with that. And, you know, their world is volatile, um, emotionally volatile, so that makes it, for me, um, kind of ripe to explore. Um, I also find that... Um, Teens kind of communicate their thoughts and feelings very openly and naturally through their faces, much more than adults do. And if you're able to um, kind of encourage that and capture it, um, then, you know, they're just forever fascinating to behold on camera. And um, what I love trying to capture is that uncertainty of um, how events are going to pan out. And with teenagers, you know, they're dancing on the edge, they're exploring, they're experimenting, trying to find that um, individual self. Um, and... Was, was there any kind of particular research you've done around these particular stories or characters um, or is there anything you've drawn from specifically? I mean, with On Your Own, yes, there was um, research because obviously that was about, about a boy living in care. Um, so I did research um, advocacy and um, all the issues faced, you know, with kids leaving care and the stigma attached, you know, to children who are in care. So there was research for that. With everything else, it's more um, sort of an instinctive approach. Um, you know, I think, I think those feelings of when you're a teen just don't leave you. I think they have such a huge impact on you. Um, and, you know, they're universal themes. We've all been there. Um, so, so, yeah, it's just really from the horrors of memory and yeah. um, just, just, just being observant. Yeah, I think um, there's a real sort of awkwardness in watching, especially in youth, totally. that first um, yeah. sort of scene is, is, uh, is incredible and it really, um, really difficult to watch, but, of course, it does bring up very memories, those awkward moments. And, and also I think it's, um, like, for me, just that idea that with all of these events, you kind of get the sense that, you know, a child's fate you know, might possibly be altered mm. by the outcome of, you know, one of these events. And, you know, I find that kind of emphasises the vulnerability of youth, um, which is a theme that I keep returning to um, because it's just really poignant and, mm. and very emotive. I think you take a very realistic standpoint as well when I say un uncompromising, you know, they're quite harrowing to watch, especially that last film. And um, I was wondering, obviously, I mean, watching that performance from from Eloise I mean it's phenomenal yeah, and also in on your own as well and and the and the kids in youth and I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about your process with with young actors um and how you've managed to draw such such incredible performance from such a young actor and not so experienced either so. um yes it's I kind of have an instinctive feeling for um, who's going to be right for a role. Mm. Um, I do see that potential in people, um, in youngsters particularly. Um, I often see it in, an, in the photograph, and it's not necessarily about the way that a kid looks. It's about something that's communicated through the eyes and, and a kind of you know, spirit and aura surrounding them. Um, I have street cast before the boy in um, youth in the first scene who's dancing around the bedroom. I actually found him skateboarding down at South Bank. Um, and with Eloise, um, basically with Sea View, we worked with a very well-respected casting director called Jill Trevelick, who Anna worked really hard to secure. And... Um, we, because we were working with Jill, we had an enormous response to the casting call, like 400 girls applied, and um, I auditioned just short of 100. Um, and Eloise, um, when I saw a photograph of Eloise, I had the instinctive feeling that it was going to be her that um, would play the role. But, you know, you've got to go through the casting process um, just in case your instincts betray you, and also... Um, you know, they might turn down the role if it's offered to them. Um, but with Eloise, she was um, utterly captivating, um, both off and on camera. Um, and we caught Eloise at that sort of cusp between, you know, she, at like one moment she would look very much like a young girl and just with a shift of a subtle expression, mm. she'd become a young woman. And that's exactly what I was looking for. Um, but 
she was um, a little bit older than the character and um, very street, very knowing, and that wasn't the character, you know, of Jess. Um, so we actually worked really hard together to... Um, we worked on her body language, we worked on expressions, um, just so that that would help her find the character of Jess. Um, and Eloise um, did a lot of prep on her own. Um, and we worked on overall technique. Um, and that was to sort of give her confidence to go into those really demanding scenes. Um, and then we had some very, very deep chats. And um, I just sort of gave her some guidelines and tips as to how to get to those emotional places that she was going to need to go to. And basically, she took the ball by the horns, rose to the challenge, and gave an absolutely outstanding performance that I knew she was capable of. But, you know, it's all that sort of building up. And, you know, a massive part of it is making sure that these kids trust you and they feel that they've got an ally in you because it is so daunting to walk, to, you know, walk on set and not know anyone mm. and to have to come, you know, pull all of that off. So essentially it's about spotting that raw potential, which I've got an instinctive feeling for, and then just helping them. Because it's inside. It's inside all of them. Um, but it's just getting, to them, getting them to the point where they feel confident enough to let it all rip. And yeah. Eloise certainly let it all rip. Well, you certainly achieved that with her. So um, I'd like to uh, put questions out to the audience now. Does anybody have a question? Don't be shy. <laughs> oh, hi. Oh, hi there. Um, I just want to ask, in the, in the, first, um, in the first film, um, the young girl <clears throat> who was um, going swimming, who was insecure about her weight, how, how did she feel with that material at such a young age and playing it the way she did was it hard to like I don't know how, how, how was it for her and how was it for you to direct her um, it was a funny story very very sweet story about Jasmine in that um, I nearly didn't spot Jasmine for that role because she actually came in to audition for um, the part of the skinny girl in the bikini <laughs> so um, <laughs> You know, and she's not big. She's got a, you know, a little bit of... She's got a tummy, you know, which I, I remember having and still have. Um, and so, yeah, that was... You know, it was tough to tell her that she'd got the part in the film but not the part that she'd auditioned for. Um, and she's, she just had, you know, an incredible sort of natural, raw talent. Um, and it's talking to them. It's that thing of... Um, I would, like with her, you know, I'd sort of show my physique and just stand there and say, you know, look at me when I stand relaxed, you know, because she's not a big girl. I say, if you just, you know, let it all go, there's your stomach. Um, and, you know, just explain to her that it was an age thing, that, you know, some girls are built differently and at a certain age, you know, you might have that puppy fat and then it, you know, disappears by the time, you know, you get to the, the older girl's age and just that different, you know, bod, um, builds builds that everybody has so yeah it's just been really sensitive and um as i say she's she wasn't a big girl she was just letting her you know tummy relax um so yeah she was um I th deep down i think of course she wanted to play the girl in the bikini um but she just loved kind of you know being involved in it I was just going to ask what made you think of making the film of the boy dancing in front of the mirror. Was that something that you did when you were young? Or? Um, hello, Ona. Hello. Oh, no, it's something I still do now. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. Um, maybe not with a belt, but um, <laughs> definitely not with a belt. Um, yeah, it's just... A little bit of imagination, and yeah, I definitely flung myself around the bedroom. Um, my brother flung himself around the bedroom. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think um, I'm trying to remember how it actually came about. I mean, definitely, you know, teens throwing themselves around the bedroom is quite a common thing, but um, I work a lot with my unconscious. So I very rarely kind of set out with an idea as to what I'm going to write. I tend to, an image will tend to come to me um, and I'll work around that. So it usually makes no sense at all what I'm about to do. I'll just get sort of like images and then wait for more to come and then make a story around them. Um, so these things are sort of buried quite deep. 
So, um, so yeah, it's sometimes hard to explain where it comes from because it definitely isn't something on the surface. So it's always going to be like a mixture of memory, a mixture of observation. And was that the first film you made, or was...? No. Um, the first film that I made was Creep, which we didn't show tonight. Um, With the little boy. Yeah, and that's, that was um, more a sort of narrative fiction, um, very much kind of beginning, middle and end. Um, and I'm a bit of a stickler for, like, things kind of looking a certain way. I've got a bit of kind of... I'm a bit of a fascist when it comes to aesthetics. And um, so I don't feel that that film sort of sits with those three. I think sort of thematically and aesthetically, those films, for me, sort of sit very well together. So I'd get a bit fidgety with the other one in. It does feel very strong stylistically, and I just wondered if, um, if you want to talk a little bit about your filmmaking style and about if there were any particular influences or creatively, and obviously you also choose to shoot on film, and whether you want to talk a little bit about that. I grew up in North Yorkshire, um, and in sort of rural, isolated surrounds. Um, and that sort of fueled my imagination. And I think it encouraged me to kind of like, you know, dig deep and explore my interior world. So I think, you know, what I do is I try to find space in my films um, so that the characters can explore their interior world and, you know, their thoughts and feelings. And I try to visualise those emotions rather than have the characters sort of necessarily articulate them through dialogue. And um, I feel sort of that the natural sort of landscape of um, the countryside um, has inspired me in terms of how I deal with light and colour in my films. Um, because like when you look over a sort of rural landscapes, particularly in um, autumn and winter, the colours sort of tend to change subtly. They go through sort of like varying tones and shades as opposed to jumping sort of dramatically. And then, you know, I've definitely thought about that when I've been making the film. So in terms of what locations I choose when I'm liaising with a costume designer or an art director, and then when it comes to the grade... You know, for me, in natural landscapes, there's a unity. Everything sort of fits, and it's very subtle. And that's what I try to do. Having said that, I did tiptoe into the world of primary colour with sea views, so who knows what's next <laughs> a little bit. But, yeah, that's... And you've mentioned, um, obviously, being based in Yorkshire. Mm. Um, how sort of London-centric do you find <laughs> the film industry? Has that been... Um, has that been an issue for you in your career, kind of not being based down here, or is that is that sort of well? Helpful? I actually, um, I only, um, I mean, yeah, I grew up in North Yorkshire, but I left home at um, sixteen, and I spent my production career working in London when I worked in the commercials industry. So from, I mean, I was here from like, um, I think it's like 15, 17 years. Um, so yeah, I I was based in London when I made three um, da, 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 sorry two of those films. When it came to Sea View, I was back up in North Yorkshire, and the reason I went back up to North Yorkshire was kind of practical reasons because when it came to writing the feature scripts, um, I couldn't afford to stay in London and I couldn't keep working in production and mm. and you know write. So um, I find that it's actually probably benefiting me for the features because I think, um, you know, in terms of the funding, they're trying to kind of make sure that everything isn't London-centric. So um, I think, you know, it's really influenced my work, but I don't think it's done me sort of like any damage that move from, you know, London to Yorkshire. If anything, it's maybe heightened my chances because, as I say, mm. um, funders are trying to sort of spread the cash when you were growing up was there any one particular film that inspired you to become a filmmaker um i didn't have a defining moment where I, whereby i watched one film and thereafter thought i was going to become a filmmaker but there were like a handful of films that um sort of definitely had an impact on me as i was growing up and those films were um, Night of the Hunter, Charles Lawton, um, Peter Weir's Picnic at Hanging Rock, Rebecca Hitchcock, Great Expectations, David Lean, Shining, Kubrick, 
And it's not that those films kind of directly influenced me stylistically, but what I did think about those films were that they were all pieces that really crept under my skin. And, you know, I just couldn't sort of... You, could ne you can't shake the feeling off of those films when you've seen them. And so... And for me, how they do that is by using atmosphere. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of what I took from those films, is that, you know, atmosphere is something to kind of think about. And if you want your film to kind of really stay with people and get under their skin, um, it's, it's kind of an aspect that, you know, I, I, I try and think about. Loving your film so far, Jane. We're looking forward to your feature film. Can you give us any clues to what it's going to be about? Oh, God, I knew you'd ask me that. <laughs> um, first of all, hello, Lucy. Hello. I just want to say Lucy is um, one of... Um, is a colleague of mine from back in the production days, and she actually has... Um, supported me from day one um, and financially helped me with lots of post-production deals so I can't thank you enough Lucy must say Spotlight's that. Spotlight's on you now Lucy. Um, and do you know why I've said all that as well is because um, I'm actually you know being a bit evasive about your question um, because as my friends will vouch I'm absolutely hopeless at telling people what things are about. I've got a real superstition about if you talk about something when you haven't actually done it it's not going to happen. I always remember this Tarkovsky quote, which was... I'm terrible at quoting verbatim, but I might remember this. Um, and he said, if you talk too much, nothing happens. <laughs> and, um, but I'll say, that, I'll say this, that um, I do continue to explore the vulnerability of youth, but it isn't a film that is completely in the world of a child. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a very strong voice from a young protagonist, but it's kind of more... The young protagonist is in finds himself in a very adult world. Um, I was just wondering, things get tough, and um, ha what inspires you, and what gets you through the, you know, the difficult times. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very good question. It's quite because yeah, it is. Um, it's tremendously tough to try and do this, and I think, you know, when you're sitting here, I mean, you know, it's taken me um, eight nine years to get to this point. Um, I, I'm not really answering. I'm probably not going to answer your question properly, but um, I think this is quite important to make. If an uh, important point to make, if there's sort of aspiring filmmakers in the audience, um, it's taken me like. I had a career in production for almost 10 years and then it was almost like starting again when I moved into making my own work. And so then it was like another eight to nine years of making shorts. Um, this idea that, you know, I've had funding, you know, I've got you know, feature coming up. Um, I had, I think it was two ideas rejected. Um, so sort of two, three years passed where I was trying to make um, a feature film. Um, you know, and it didn't happen. So, and in terms of what gets me through, ooh, I think it's maybe, um, it's a drive of, like, I've started this. I'm not particularly ambitious. I know that probably sounds a bit odd, but I'm not ambitious, but I've got a strong drive. And if something feels right to me, then I'll keep doing it. If it doesn't feel right, I'm out. Um... And, you know, I've sort of set myself this huge challenge and I'm sort of determined to keep doing it whilst it feels right. Um, and my friends, my family, my lovely whippet dog um, <laughs> keep me sane. Um, because, yeah, it, it's tough and it does send you a bit doolally sometimes. We were working about, in this industry, yeah. We were talking about that, weren't we, and that kind of... Once you're in it, you're in it for the long haul because it does seem to take so much time and... Um, I think one thing I was quite interested in was obviously following the youth, you were featured as a screen star of Tomorrow, which has, you know, been an amazing kickstart for, you know, people like Andrew Arnold, Abby Morgan. And um, and just wondering how difficult it is to kind of, you know, you kind of get that exposure and, and just keep that momentum and sustain your life as a filmmaker kind of in that journey towards, um, you know, hopefully the, kind of the feature film, which just how difficult that is or how helpful that um, kind of exposure was. If I'm honest, the stars <laughs> of tomorrow thing is 
probably just because I kind of had nothing else on my bio. It's like I've made all these films. I'm not, you know, like a huge award-winning filmmaker. Um, so this Star of Tomorrow just keeps creeping no, just back. just BAFTA nominators. That's yeah, but that, I didn't have that until, <laughs> what, two days ago. So that sort of fills in a bit of the bio. But, um, <laughs> but no, it's true. It's like, you know, the Star of Tomorrow, it, it, it fills in a gap in the um, bio, to be honest. <laughs> so, and it's a bit cheesy, isn't it? But um, what was I going to say about the... Oh, yeah, I think the difficulty is when you write and direct your own work, that's what makes it extraordinarily a long process. Mm. Um, so what I found was when I got these rejections for the feature films um, in 2008, 2009, 2010, um, I went back to you know, make two short films in that period um, because you start to lose the confidence that has taken you so long to sort of build up in terms of the practical filmmaking. Um, and, you know, that's the hard part is, you, if, as I say, if you write direct, you, you go off, squirrel yourself away um, to try and write something. And in all that time, you, you know, you're not physically making any films so this idea that then you're going to go out and make a feature film oh my god it, you know it's so daunting because you just think well I don't know what I'm doing now because I haven't done it for like you know three four years so you know in the times that I was getting the rejections that's what I tried to do um was obviously go back and make a couple more films mm. um any more questions for the audience I um, I just want to ask about funding uh, like for your first film did you kind of fund it yourself, or do you find it hard to get funding, or...? Yeah, I'll quickly scoot through what my situation was. Um, so with the first film, I thought I was going to get regional funding um, from um, up in Yorkshire, and it all fell through at the last minute. And basically, because I had got so far with the prep, um, and, you know, that's what I sort of set my task as, um, I stepped out of the world of production to, for like three months to try and pull this off and then the um, funding went up the spout so I you know I literally used my savings I mean I've been I've been working in production for god I don't know at that point five six years um, so I just plowed in what what money I had in the bank my second film youth I did exactly the same thing because I didn't get funding from doo -doo 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 -doo, uh, digital um, that I can't remember what it was. It was some scheme that was going at the time. I didn't get funding for that. And again, I'd kind of done a lot of prep and I just thought, oh. So what was it? It was like three years between the films. So um, I spent my savings and my earnings because I was still working. I was still working in production as I was making these. The third one, On Your Own, um, I was actually asked to write that for Cinema Extreme. Um, and I got down to the last two and I was pipped at the post and didn't get the funding for that. So again, I made it myself, but I actually got completion funding. Um, so I think I stumped up about, if we're going to talk figures, uh, 50, about 15 grand and then got about five grand completion money. Um, and then just lastly, obviously, um, CV was funded. But, you know, this obviously makes it sound like I've got I had loads of money. But the fact was, is I was working, um, you know, full on in, a produ in the production world and getting paid well because, it's, you know, it was a well-paid job. But, you know, what I sacrificed was, you know, that was basically me working for 10 years. And by this point, you know, I should have property, I should have had lots of nice holidays. And, you know, th that's the sacrifices. Um, I'm very financially unstable now. I've got no money in the bank. And that's where it all went. Did you have to ask for a lot of favours and try and get people to work for free and all that kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, I did. Um, I mean, what I tried to do was obviously, as I was saying, people like Lucy, um, sort of production colleagues, um, um, Genevieve Simmers, she um, helped co-produce Youth um, and she helped me with the post-production on that. So yeah, just having very, very supportive female colleagues. Um, and what else was I going to say about the funding? You must feel enormous satisfaction with um, obviously working with the BFI short scheme on CVU and now being selected for funding for your first feature through the BFI. Does that kind of feel like you finally kind of got to that point where it's not those rejections and it's, you know, it's not the life savings, but it's actually, you know, that real recognition and next stage sort of thing? Um, well, I've only 
I think what it feels like is I have had sort of the stamp of approval for the script because essentially they've responded to the script in saying, yeah, you know, we think this would work and we are prepared to stump up, you know, half of the production finance. But it doesn't it, it doesn't mean to say I've got that. They're no. basically saying, you know, you can have that, but then you've got to find the rest of the money to actually make the film. So in no means does it mean I'm there. <laughs> Um, you know, not at all. This It's like they're saying they will give me the money if somebody else will give me the other bit. So, you know, there's always that... You can never relax and think you're there. I mean, I was looking at jobs, like, a few weeks ago, um, thinking, oh, maybe I'll become um, a mentor for, for kids or, like, conservation up in the countryside. Because that's how, <laughs> you know, seriously, that's how the rug can be pulled from under you. You, you never feel you're there. Mm -hmm. until you're actually in the midst of production, which is probably why I'm so wary about discussing, you know, what the next thing's going to be about, because it could be on the shelf for another five years. Well, it's hotly anticipated. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, do we have any final audience questions before we head to the bar? Oh, OK. We'll the Sorry, other I just wanted to <laughs> ask how you felt it compared doing the films with your own money and therefore no overseeing versus the... BFI, which has the financial support, but then more people to answer to. I kind of felt with the, the ones that I'd funded, I was sort of putting my money where my mouth was. It was that thing of like, oh, you think you can do this? OK, you know, you're paying. It was almost like paying for the experience just to see if I could do it. Whereas when I got, when I got the funding, it was... Um, I was nervous because I suddenly thought, oh, my God, you know, it's not like they gave me the money, but I think it was, you know, it was in the region of, like, 40 grand that we got to make the film, which, you know, isn't a lot when, you know, everybody has to be paid, you know, four-day shoot. Um, you know, and obviously the fees are minimal, but... Um, yeah, it's... And obviously it's tremendously difficult to kind of move through... Just have everybody, yeah, have an opinion on your work. Um, and, you know, some of it you've got to take on board, but some of it you've also... You've just got to have a really clear sense of what you want and what you're trying to communicate, but also still be open to what people are saying to you because, you know, there could be one thing that, you know, just strengthens your project. Um, so, yeah, of, yeah, it's definitely hard, and it was definitely hard for me because, yeah, I had had that free reign before. Um, but, yeah, ultimately, I couldn't... There's absolutely no way on earth I could have done it any other way. I mean, I just wouldn't have made another film because I'd literally, you know, I'm sort of wiped out financially now from doing this. So, um, so yeah, it kind of have to take what's been said to me and I'm very grateful, you know, finally, you know, to get some support. It's incredible. Yeah, and I have to say that actually about the BFI is I don't make, you know, obviously commercial work. I don't make genre work. And, you know, this is a business. Um, and there's only really the BFI that are pu putting money into sort of like culturally sort of relevant projects um, or, you know, p projects that are sort of, you know, not necessarily co seen as commercial projects. So, you know, it's fantastic to me for me to have that support, which, you know, I've never had. And, um, you know, it's a very difficult industry when you're not making commercial work. Um, it's quite a specific question, but um, I thought CV was phenomenal because I think it really um, throws up some interesting topics. Um, and I just wondered, in the film, Jess says that she's had sex before and how definite you are in your mind as to whether or not she's lying, like whether it's about first experience or someone that's been kind of damaged repeatedly uh, um yeah just kind of what your take on that was um yeah it is open to interpretation i mean for me what i was trying to express with that is you know i've and one of the reasons i wanted to make this film is i feel there is a tremendous pressure on young people and particularly girls to be sexually active from a very young age um and I wanted to kind of explore the idea that sometimes when you get sexually involved and you've done the deed, it's like, it's nothing. It's like, it's just a physical act. But it doesn't take away from that fact that you're too young and you're not emotionally prepared for the, you know, the sort of, you know, downfall, as it were, in this case. 
So for me, it was that idea that it doesn't really matter whether you've done the deed, you know, it isn't about, you know, for her sort of losing virginity. It's about the fact when it all goes horribly wrong and when you're faced with that huge rejection that you are, you know, it's not about the legality of the situation, it's about the fact that that girl is not emotionally prepared for that situation and thereby, you know, the responsibility lies with, you know, with the adults, with us, to protect kids from, you know, I mean, just from having to experience um, something that they're just too young to experience. Um, you know, and I remember feeling that sort of pressure as a teen. And, you know, for, for girls now, I just think, oh, you know, really, my heart goes out to them because it's just too much to have to take on at that age. I think we'd love to um, continue this conversation through to the ICA bar. And um, I just want to let everyone know that um, on behalf of Lighthouse, uh, we're extending a drink. And I've got the menu here, a Peroni, uh, white or red wine, <laughs> or a soft drink. Um, and uh, and I'd, I'd like to welcome you to, to uh, thank Jane for, for joining us this evening. So thank you. <laughs>